served as general counsel to the Chicago Board of Health. He served as deputy mayor, city of Chicago. General counsel, Chicago Park District. Lieutenant governor, attorney general, two terms. He was a partner in two major law firms. He was unanimously elected to the, as justice of the appellate court, and he's chairman of the World Trade Center Chicago, roughly 35 years in public service, Neil Hardigan. Neil? Thank you very much, Jay. State's Attorney Dick Devine. Father Claire, I should reverse that, Dick. If we either one of us have any chance of getting there, we better start Father Claire, State's Attorney Dick Devine. <laughs> Distinguished uh, elected officials and heads of the various agencies. I was looking forward to the privilege of introducing Lisa Madigan until I sat there next to my friend, Sidney Epstein, and suffered, no, not suffered through, went through <laughs> The, the introductions of that master of understatement, Jay Doherty, certainly including the one he gave me. You know, I, I'd be remiss, General, if I, I didn't say very quickly at the outset that I know Tom and I both remember when you could come to a city club, BD, you could fire a cannon and you wouldn't hit a soul. This is the single best forum in this or any other city to give everybody a chance to see the leaders of the city and the state and the federal level uh, on a consistent basis, whether you're involved in government or leadership in any sense, just any citizen that wants to be part of something who comes to the city club can see the leaders of thought on a week in, week out basis and nobody, nobody thought it possible until Jay Dory and Paul Green and Tom Roser, but especially Jay Doherty created it. And uh, I think this city owes him a real debt of gratitude. I also owe him dues, so that probably had something to do with that. Lisa Madigan is an extraordinary person. And I say that first and foremost, rather than saying an extraordinary public official, which she also is. But I think what makes it the latter is the former. What she is is a person, because it's been reflected in every stage of her career up to this point. Whether it was in her student life at Georgetown, or the work she did in Africa after Georgetown, the work she did when she came back and went to school at Loyola and Dean Yellen I said to you earlier, I extended my sympathy to you because Phil Rock and Tom Hines and I and others were, were among your alumni, and it's tough to be the dean of a school like that. But Lisa Madigan is a good loyal alumnus. I mean, you can, be, you can use her as the commercial. The volunteer activities she was involved in there and the scholarship that she showed at Loyola were reflections of the commitment to excellence that she has. She didn't take an easy way to get to public life. There is absolutely nothing glamorous about a district station where you're trying to help a kid who's in trouble or prevent somebody from getting in trouble or deal with a tough family situation. But she created new ways of approaching that. She did the same thing in, in her work in public life on the law enforcement side. She didn't take the easy way when she went into the legislature. She ran in a district that was a long way from the easiest district to run in. It wasn't part of the traditional base that is the strongest base out the southwest side of, of the Democratic Party. It was up on the north side in a district where she started going door to door to door to door and talking with human beings one at a time. 
and ran one of the best campaigns that I've ever seen. In the Senate, her commitment to excellence and to children and to the environment, consumerism, reflected itself quickly. And then she ran for attorney general. And people said, oh, how can she run for attorney general? They found out very quickly how she could run. She could run exceptionally well and then serve even better. I don't think anybody, and I had the good fortune of coming from a family that was in government. Actually, there's only half a dozen families, by the way, where a son or a daughter followed the parent into government in this town, if you stop and think about it. But when you do, then I think my dad was, uh, was gone 20 years before I, you know, I was always introduced as Dave's son, and I was very proud of that. In a shorter period of time than anybody I've ever seen, as, as fond as she is and as proud as she is of the accomplishments of her mother and her father, she carved out her own niche among the Attorneys General of America. Not just the Attorney General of Illinois, the Attorney Generals of America. Ask Elliot Spitzer. Ask Bill Lockyer in California. Ask Tom Miller in Iowa, the best in the business, what they think of Lisa Madigan as an Attorney General. Ask the people that she's taken the lead on. Look at the fight she's leading now on metroamphetamine. Headlines? No, it's not going to be headlines, but it's going to save the lives of a lot of kids all over this state, starting in downstate where it's ravaging the state right now. Sexual offenders? They're traced for life now because of her initiative. <laughs> Ask the elderly what she's done on pricing of uh, prescriptions and the needs they have as far as the, the terrible economic burden that those things place on them and the fights that she's waged in predatory land and the other things. She makes a difference. No first attorney general in this state's history has ever made the kind of difference that Lisa has made. She runs a first class office at a time where unfortunately there's too many things said negatively about people in government. Not one single word has ever been said about Lisa Madigan or anybody in her office. And if there ever was, they wouldn't be in their office, her office for five minutes about integrity if it was a negative thing. The standard there is absolute, absolute integrity. Absolute ex excellence. This is a person who we are absolutely fortunate to have and who I believe is the best attorney general in this country. And we're going to be even more fortunate whenever the time is appropriate that she'll be the first woman to serve as governor of this state. And we're way overdue for that. Please join in welcoming Attorney General Lisa Madigan. Neil, thank you very much for that kind uh, and generous introduction, but let's not get me in trouble today. There are enough people in the room trying to do that. <laughs> that is true. He was going to nominate me for president. I told him, wait, really, in spite of what USA Today has to say. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is always a pleasure to be in front of the City Club. Uh, there are many, many people in this room uh, that I count among my close friends, even some of you who don't realize that you are my close friends. <laughs> That's simply because professionally we have jobs that we have to do, and we will continue to do them with professionalism, uh, and I look forward to that. Well, as usual, a lot has happened since I spoke with you last year. On January 15th, uh, I became a mom. <laughs> And for those of you who are parents, you know what an extraordinary, amazing miracle it is. Uh, our daughter's name is Rebecca Grace. She is just nine months old. She got her first tooth on Sunday. She's starting to figure out that she can crawl across the floor. So we are told that things will rapidly change in our lives for the worse. Uh, but we love her. For any of you who share that birthday, January 15th, uh, you would probably be interested to know that it is the same day that Martin Luther King was born, as well as Charo. So we think she has great and varied opportunities for her future. 
Nine days after Rebecca was born, I learned that uh, the case that I argued in front of the United States Supreme Court uh, that I spoke with you at length about last year, we won it. So uh, <laughs> clap now, but let me remind you what this means as a warning. Uh, in case you have forgotten or in case you weren't here last year, the issue that the US Supreme Court uh, decided was whether or not a drug detection dog can be used at a routine traffic stop? The answer is yes. And you may wonder why. Uh, it's because that you have no legitimate privacy interest uh, in concealing illegal drugs. And so what the court actually said, and Justice Stevens wrote uh, for the court, it was a 6-2 decision, it said a dog sniff conducted during a lawful traffic stop that reveals no information other than the location of a substance that no individual has any right to possess does not violate the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and there's quiet. There, some of you might be worried, and I'm sorry for that. Um, <laughs> But for your information, the Chicago Police Department currently does not use drug detection dogs uh, for those purposes. They don't use them at traffic stops. But if you spend a lot of time on the interstates, on the highways, uh, particularly those that are used as uh, drug trafficking corridors, the state police do. And uh, the, the circumstances surrounding uh, this case, the actual facts, uh, it involved an individual who was speeding, got pulled over, and uh, while one state trooper was writing up a warning ticket, another state trooper who was part of a canine unit showed up, walked a dog around the car. The dog alerted to the presence of drugs in the trunk. When they opened the trunk, 300 pounds of marijuana. So beware, you have no right to conceal drugs in the trunk of your car, in case you were wondering. Um, on the legislative front, Neil was very nice to mention, uh, but it was uh, a very significant and important accomplishment, I think, that this spring in the legislative session, we were finally able to pass lifetime supervision for sex offenders here in the state of Illinois. And so Illinois now joins 12 other states where we have lifetime supervision for sex offenders. And this means a tremendous amount to those children, and those women who have been victims of sexual assault. Um, really, and we've talked about this before, uh, there, there is nothing, I think, uh, that is more important that we do than use our resources to better protect people from tragedies that we can prevent. We know the rate of recidivism is very high among sex offenders, and the reality is that even though they are required, most of them are required to register uh, simply because somebody registered does not mean that we have the level of supervision necessary to prevent them from committing another crime. That's why lifetime supervision is so important. It potentially puts in place supervision for, as it says, the rest of this offender's life. And what that means is, instead of you know somebody checking your address once a year, you potentially have a parole officer checking on you at home and at work five times a month, uh, which will go a long way toward preventing these people from disappearing. It will go a long way toward making sure that they're not involved with people uh, that they have victimized previously, whether at work, volunteer activities, or where they live. So this is a very significant accomplishment and one that I am quite, quite proud of. Almost a year ago, we also put in place in the Office of the Attorney General a public access counselor. It is a position that Indiana has. There are a number of other states that have such a thing. But uh, as the Attorney General, we were constantly getting calls and concerns from individual citizens as well as the news media and, and even other public bodies, not quite sure how they should respond to a Freedom of Information Act request, or not quite sure whether or not uh, there had been a violation of the Open Meetings Act. And in our goal to make sure that people are abiding by the laws and that government is open and accessible, uh, we put in place this position. And we have received, at this point, um, approximately 800 requests to deal with uh, potential uh, FOIA or OMA violations. 
We're also conducting, or will have conducted by the end of the year, approximately 60 trainings where we go out and we meet with school boards, we meet with municipalities, we have the, the news media there, and others who are interested and some who are not interested, but we've told them they have to be interested because otherwise we'll think of something more extreme to do than just a training. And so they've come out to participate and that's been successful. But this afternoon, what I want to focus on is another issue uh, that Neil Hartigan brought up. And, uh, and he was right to say that it, it's not a particularly sexy issue in Chicago. But as far as law enforcement goes, it is probably the number one threat that the state of Illinois is facing. And that's methamphetamine. Um, I don't know how many of you in this room have heard of methamphetamine. We call it meth for short. Uh, but as I said, it is an issue that if you haven't heard about it, you are likely to hear about it. And it is something that we have been working on out of my office uh, ever since I became the Attorney General. The main reason that meth poses such a threat is that it's a very unique drug. Uh, it is a unique drug because if you are crazy enough, you can purchase all the ingredients necessary to manufacture meth, and you can do it in your own home. Uh, people have not only used their homes, they go to motel rooms and destroy them. Uh, they go outside and they do it at campgrounds. Uh, there's an increasing number of mobile meth labs that law enforcement is intercepting. So people who are driving down the public highways and roads who are using the back of the van, the trunk of their car, to manufacture uh, not just a deadly drug, but the chemicals used are very dangerous and very toxic. Meth is essentially made by taking pseudoephedrine containing cold medication and mixing it with these toxic chemicals to remove one of the oxygen molecules in pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine is a very typical over-the-counter cold medication or allergy medication, so Sudafed. Uh, I'm sure most people in this room at one point or another have purchased Sudafed. Some of you may actually take it with some frequency if you have allergies. So that's really what you absolutely have to have. Sudafed is the key ingredient used in the manufacture of meth, but these other ingredients, and let me go through the list, are uh, things that you, you, know, you don't want to be playing with. Lighter fluid, uh, Coleman fuel, lye, sulfuric acid, uh, lithium batteries, packs of matches, and hydrous ammonia. Uh, if anybody's from a downstate community or knows much about farming, anhydrous ammonia is a chemical that is used as a fertilizer. And one of the reasons that meth has really taken hold in downstate Illinois and in rural communities across the country is because nurse tanks that hold anhydrous ammonia are sitting out in fields. And so these meth addicts, uh, when they want to manufacture a batch of meth, all they have to do is go to one of these nurse tanks and steal anhydrous ammonia. It's very dangerous to do, and many of these individuals uh, end up getting burned all over their body when they do it. But again, we're not dealing with sane people at this point. We're dealing with criminals. We're dealing with people who are addicted to a very dangerous drug. And so we've passed a lot of laws, and we've worked to put in place uh, measures that will really prohibit people or punish people uh, when they decide to steal meth or when we catch them, when they decide to steal anhydrous, when we catch them in possession of anhydrous and they have no legitimate use for it. But as I said, anhydrous is not essential to making meth. There's only one ingredient that you have to have, and that's the pseudoephedrine. So the pseudoephedrine, I sometimes say, is, is similar to the flour in making a cake. You just absolutely have to have it. Um, at this point, you may be wondering, well, that's kind of interesting, Lisa, but, but, but why? Why would anybody uh, in their right mind, and maybe that's really the answer to the question, want to be mixing these chemicals together and, uh, and ingesting the result into their body? It's obviously uh, a somewhat easy and somewhat difficult question to answer. What happens is people take meth. And it is so highly addictive. And I know you've probably heard people say, you know, crack cocaine, the most addictive drug. Well, methamphetamine has proven to be as highly, if not more highly addictive than any other drug that we've seen. And so people get addicted to meth, and because they can make it, uh, they do. 
The next question you're probably asking yourself is, well, that's interesting, but why do I care? Why should this issue have any relevance? I've never heard about this drug, or I've heard very little about this drug. It's mainly a downstate issue, uh, and so why, why are we talking about it? As I said, uh, meth, I'd say up to the beginning of this year, has really been considered the downstate rural problem. But that is unfortunately changing very quickly. Uh, and so in this past year, there are a number of busts that have been made in the city of Chicago where individuals have been found with extraordinarily large amounts of methamphetamine. And recently, we are starting to find labs in the city of Chicago. They found them as well uh, in DuPage and Burr Ridge. And the problem with these labs is that the chemicals, as I mentioned, that are used, in addition to being toxic, are incredibly dangerous when you mix them together. 20% of labs nationwide are found because of a fire or an explosion that takes place. And so having a lab in a very congested urban area in an apartment building where some of these have been found in Lakeview uh, could have an impact uh, that results in, in the death of people. And that's one of the reasons you need to be concerned. Another reason is that there is a recent survey that was conducted by the Chicago Department of Public Health. And what they found among gay men in the city of Chicago is that approximately 11% of them have tried meth. The obvious concern there is that we are going to see an increase in the rate of HIV AIDS infections because people who are using this drug are also having unprotected sex. And so that is a cause uh, for great concern. Unfortunately, there are numerous individuals, innocent individuals, uh, in addition to regular citizens, uh, that end up being impacted by meth. You have law enforcement, who obviously when they actually bust a lab, they seize one of these labs, uh, have ended up losing their limbs losing fingers, being severely burned. You have firefighters who have had to go through the same sort of thing. You have individuals who are involved in these hazmat teams who have suffered permanent damage to their lungs from inhaling this anhydrous ammonia and these other chemicals. And so there is an enormous impact to the first responders, to law enforcement and others who are involved. I'd say one of the greatest tragedies about meth, we find children in these labs. Um, my office actually prosecuted a case where the lab itself was set up in a five-year-old child's bedroom. The Illinois State Police have found labs that are actually hidden in toy boxes. And so people, when they are trying to hide these things, keep them away from, from the public eye and certainly from law enforcement, uh, have completely neglected uh, any responsibility that they have to safeguarding the children uh, that they should be there to protect and to raise. In fact, in southern Illinois right now, the reason that they are starting to see an increase in the number of children that are becoming wards of the state is because there are so many parents who've become addicted to this drug uh, that once they're discovered, um, you know, there's somebody else has to take care of these children. Cleaning meth labs. The waste that is left over uh, after you mix all these chemicals together is hazardous material. And so as I mentioned earlier, we have to bring in hazmat teams, two to four specially trained people to clean up these labs. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there are times where individuals uh, who are manufacturing the meth as well as those who are actually involved in responding and cleaning it up uh, end up in the emergency room. Emergency care is extremely expensive. Uh, Health care becomes extremely expensive for these individuals. We also have an extraordinary drain on law enforcement resources. Uh, when I talk to sheriffs from downstate Illinois, they tell me that over 80% of their time can be, and in some cases is spent, just on dealing with meth labs. The state of Oklahoma recently testified at a hearing that I had. They have estimated that the cost of each lab in public resources is approximately $350,000 per lab. So go back, add up what, what I was just talking about, the cleanup, uh, obviously, the, the personnel time, dealing with children, uh, sometimes the treatment that is involved, because th there is treatment for this drug, but it is very long. 
uh, term in order for it to be effective, and therefore it becomes very, very expensive. So you may not have heard about it, but you at this point are paying for these meth labs that are all over the state of Illinois at this point. Well, the next obvious question you should ask me is, well, okay, Lisa, then what are you doing about this? Well, in fact, as soon as I leave here today, I'm going to Springfield uh, to testify on a bill. So you're kind of a guinea pig audience. Um, but they kind of know most of the background that I just went through. Two years ago, uh, we started working on this issue with the legislature. And what we started working on was to find a way to restrict access to pseudoephedrine. In order to do that, we worked on a bill that put um, adult strength single active ingredient pseudoephedrine containing medications uh, behind a counter. And we put a limit on the number of packages that individuals can buy at any one time. And we required training for store personnel because we knew and we continue to know that while this is a problem in the rural communities, it wasn't as much of a problem in Chicago and therefore the individuals who were manufacturing meth were coming to Chicago to purchase their pseudoephedrine because you know, nobody knew about it and nobody cared. So when you'd walk up to the counter with every single package of pseudoephedrine containing cold medication you'd get your hands on, nobody thought anything of it. And uh, to the extent that there are some stores that before this law had already put restrictions in place, uh, we encountered clerks who would say, well, I can only sell you five packs. Why don't you go over to the next counter and you know, purchase another five? And so we knew that there had to be an explanation and required training of personnel so that when they did see somebody coming to the counter and they had a lot of you know, lithium batteries and all kinds of Sudafed and, and uh, they use coffee filters, and lighter fluid, somebody might think twice, hopefully, call the police department and say, there's a suspicious purchase being made, you know, can you follow up and investigate? Well, we passed this, what we thought, and really what at the time in the Midwest was the strongest law uh, out there. Uh, it wasn't as strong as Oklahoma's law, but Oklahoma had had a horrifying tragedy uh, where a law officer had been killed uh, by an individual meth maker. And so when they went to their legislature, the legislature was ready to, uh, you know, to ban uh, pseudoephedrine containing cold medications from stores entirely. So we worked with the retailers. We came to a compromise. We passed what we thought was a good bill, and in fact it was. Uh, but then what happened is this past spring, all of our bordering states, so... Iowa, Missouri, Kentucky, Indiana, and Wisconsin, they all passed legislation uh, that has gone into effect that is much stronger than the law we had here in Illinois. What they have done is they've moved to something called Schedule 5, and most of you in this room are old enough to remember when coding cough medicine, uh, people were abusing that, and so you suddenly was put behind a counter, you needed to you know, go through a few extra hoops to acquire it. This is the same sort of thing. What Schedule 5 requires is, and what it will require for pseudoephedrine containing medications, it's all going to have to be behind a pharmacy counter. In order to purchase it, you are going to have to show an ID and you're going to have to sign a log. And there's going to be a limit as to how much you can purchase per month. But don't worry, it's enough for you to take uh, if you do have allergies. In fact, it's a little more than you would even need to take. We're doing this because we have been alerted by Illinois State Police, local law enforcement, as well as now law enforcement from our neighboring states, that Illinois is simply becoming the meth ingredient shopping mall of the Midwest. Uh, I held a number of hearings in September and October uh, in communities that bordered other states. So we went up to Rock Island, we went over to Quincy, we went down to Glen Carbon in the Metro East area, and Law enforcement from Oklahoma, Iowa, and Missouri came over and told us just unimaginable but unfortunately true stories. Situations where they've intercepted people and they have found, and there was, there was a recent one, where they found somebody had come to Chicago, purchased 10,000 pseudoephedrine pills uh, to use in the manufacture of meth. And again, because you're anonymous in a big city uh, and there's no requirement here to show an ID or sign a log, People are driving from as far away as Arkansas to come to Chicago to do this. 
Uh, we know well that people are coming from the St. Louis area up to Chicago to do this because when these labs are busted, they've kept all their receipts and so they can track back, oftentimes they find receipts, they can track back uh, you know, where this has come from. So we obviously have to make sure that our law is as strong as uh, the laws in our surrounding states because while it's bad enough to be the shopping mall of the Midwest, what we really don't want to happen is taking over the undistinguished title that Missouri has held for a number of years, which is meth capital of the United States. Uh, so our bordering state, Missouri, has been number one. Iowa uh, has been number two in the country. We don't want those people setting up shop here. It's too dangerous, it's too expensive, and there are things that we can do to prevent it from happening. Um, one of the situations we found in Iowa, uh, and the Iowa law enforcement testified to this, is when they busted a lab in Burlington, Iowa, which is a little bit west and maybe a little bit south of Galesburg, at the lab they found a, a six-page list that had been generated off of Yahoo, and it had all of the Walgreens and all of the Walmarts in Galesburg, Peoria, and Bloomington, and there were notations about how easy or, or not easy, for that matter, it was to purchase pseudoephedrine products at those stores. And so that's what they were using. They were coming into Illinois to do this. So there is obviously work to do. We know that by passing Schedule 5, we will see a reduction in the number of meth labs. Iowa has seen uh, an 80% reduction. Oklahoma has seen a 60% reduction. And right now, there are 35 other states, actually there are 34 other states, that have some form of this control in place. And so I hope that within the next two weeks, we will be able to say we will have those restrictions in place roughly around the beginning of the year so that uh, none of you really ever need to know anything more about meth than what I have just told you. With that, uh, let me say thank you again for this opportunity. I know that we have questions, and that's always the most entertaining part of this anyway. Uh, so let us open this up for questions. Master of Ceremonies, moderator. Right, I am flying to Springfield, I apologize. Is that how much time I get to respond? <laughs> Bridget. <laughs> Lisa, how's your re-election campaign looking? What do you think is going to come up? Do you think you'll For have a For anybody who wants to make a contribution, <laughs> my finance director's here. Jill Baldwin, who we've just brought on. Um, you know, I haven't done any polling uh, at this point. I presume things uh, look good, but, you know, everybody who faces re-election, it is always a challenge. And uh, it is certainly hopeful that I don't have to go through uh, another ugly uh, campaign as I did the first time when I ran for attorney general. Uh, I certainly think that I have shown and demonstrated that I am more than capable uh, of holding the job as attorney general. My priorities have been uh, the people of the state of Illinois, and it's, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to serve as the people's lawyer, and I certainly hope that uh, the citizens of the state recognize that I've done a good job and reelect me. I'm Nance Dule from West Lawn, and we're very proud of you. My question is this, uh, the liquid containers that are near a, a railroad, for instance, near Belt Railroad on the southwest side. Uh, what is that liquid? It's used to clean the rails. Do you have any idea? We were wondering if they're toxic. Um, I was looking over and hoping that the individual from uh, the Chicago Department of the Environment was still here, but he has apparently escaped. He probably planted it. Is there anybody in the room who knows the answer to that question? I do not. Do. But there may be somebody in my environmental division that does. And so would somebody, Nick, from my office, will you go talk to Nance and hook those people together? Thank you very much. Sorry. While you're stepping up, there's the Attorney General's table over there. How about give them a round of applause? Yeah, they're wonderful. Oh, we have a question, Commissioner. The tanks that are along the side of the railroad. <laughs> no, no, it's a real question. Don't laugh. Go see him after the. Nance, come here. Come here. We'll direct you. 
This is the city club. Speakers can sandbag just as well as questioners. <laughs> Here, I'll make sure the podium doesn't fall. General Madigan, uh, yes. my name's Richard Streetman. I work for Cook County. Um, unfortunately, we saw with Katrina that government does matter. You mentioned two things that uh, in, your, in your speech. You mentioned AIDS and you mentioned uh, crack cocaine. They remind me of methamphetamine. I serve on an advisory committee with the state's attorney here, Dick Devine, and uh, he's shown incredible leadership on this issue. And unfortunately, for the last year, we spend more time talking about methamphetamine than just about anything else. Um, what is it that we can do? Is this legislation going to simply be changing uh, pseudoephedrine to Schedule 5? Or is, I mean, I don't think there's enough money from what we've been hearing to fight this. In what terms is it? Of treatment? Well, treatment is a big part as of it. As well as law enforcement. Right. I mean, this, unfortunately, the Bush administration has treated this as some kind of. Question. Let her answer. <laughs> Let her answer. Okay. One speaker what is it that we can do to make sure that the government acts on this issue despite the fact that the national government seems to not care? Oh, so in Illinois, and I'm remiss, uh, Cook County State's Attorney Dick Devine has been incredibly helpful and incredibly supportive, along with uh, Superintendent Phil Klein. Uh, we've had numerous meetings, uh, in particular with individuals uh, with the gay and lesbian community to talk about what we should be doing. There's a lot of pro bono advertising that Leo Burnett has provided mm -hmm. on a lot of the uh, big summer events that take place in the gay community. There was a lot of information provided uh, in terms of prevention. Uh, at the state level, there have been uh, millions and millions of dollars set aside for treatment programs and to make sure that we have resources available. By making pseudoephedrine containing products Schedule 5, we will effectively reduce the number of meth labs and therefore overburden law enforcement will have an ability to, to do what they normally are doing and it will have an impact. Now, the federal government uh, is not doing nothing. They're just a little slow right now. <laughs> so, typical. Um, just like crack and just like AIDS though. They are actually looking at putting in place Schedule 5 nationwide. The concern obviously is with the reports that we've been getting, we simply can't wait because we don't know when that's going to happen. And even the way the, the current federal bill is drafted, it has a phase-in period where it does not become fully effective until 2007. Well, 2007, we would be overrun uh, here in the state of Illinois. And the federal government has earmarked some dollars in terms of putting in place uh, electronic databases to actually track individual sales of the pseudoephedrine so that law enforcement can use that for investigative purposes and prosecution purposes. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi. Thanks for your comments on the drug prevention efforts. Can you also elaborate Major a little? Marcy May. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of your efforts to protect consumers in Illinois? Wow. How much more time do we have? <laughs> Last year, we received over 24,000 consumer fraud complaints. Um, and I'm not going to name, I'm not going to go through my top 10 list because I do that with Spike at some point during the year. Um, let's say the number one concern I think people should have, and this is all of us, uh, it's identity theft. All of those emails that you get where, you know, regarding your bank account, uh, regarding your eBay account, uh, phishing scams, and now we're seeing a slight iteration on that, what they call them farming scams. Again, that's all spelled with a PH. Uh, really one of the best things people can possibly do have a, if you're not on a network that provides a good security system, make sure that you put in place um, some spam blocking filters uh, because those emails, 99% of the time, probably closer to 100% of the time, uh, are simply attempts to get your personal financial information. So we are contending right now uh, with Medicare and this new prescription drug coverage. It is not just incredibly confusing, but it provides a ripe opportunity for con artists to contact older people, uh, people with disabilities, and to get their, uh, people have been asking for bank account routing numbers off the bottom of people's checks. If anybody calls you and asks you for that, the answer is no. Um, you know, so that's an enormous problem. We're seeing real 
problems in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina uh, with individuals who claim to be from the Red Cross or other reputable charities uh, who are raising money for nobody but themselves. Again, you should be the one that initiates the contact. Uh, we have a whole public uh, part of our office that deals with the regulation of charities in the state. Um, Foreign lottery scams is another really important and big one these days. So, you know, ev almost everybody, but actually not everybody, has uh, res actually knows about those so-called Nigerian banking scams. And I say that because, no joke, just a month ago, somebody in Illinois, I think, lost close to $12,000 responding to one. Um, but there's kind of a new iteration of those, and we call them foreign lottery scams. You get a letter, and it says, you just won the Spanish lottery. You just won the New Zealand lottery. And I know some of you in this room travel, and you've been to those places, but not everybody has. And if you were there, you probably didn't buy a lottery ticket. So you didn't win. But the way these... <laughs> Yeah. I know everyone laughs, but we get a fair number of people calling our office every week saying, hey, I sent these people thousands of dollars, and now they're not sending me my millions of dollars, and we have to explain to them that, in fact, it's a scam, and oftentimes people will be very upset and accuse us of trying to prevent them from getting their winnings. So believe it or not, um, I'm here to warn you, don't deal with those foreign lottery scams when you get them. So, so those are just some of the things that we spend a lot of time on. Thank you. You are welcome. Lisa, Joel Cohen, CEO, Richard Hoffman Corporation. Hypothetical question, <laughs> purely hypothetical. If there was a chief law enforcement officer of a state who's very young and very attractive, very thin, uh, a new mom. I'm already married, Joel. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Oh, I said, uh, uh, new mom, um, and she now, on, and this shortens the hypothetical question, because Neil has already, you know, placed her in the governor's office. Hypothetically, what happens, or what does that person think about after that? Well, it's a hypothetical question, yes. so... Yes. so oh, that's just also with a great sense of humor, <laughs> this hypothetical person. Joel is a lawyer. I can't speculate. Excellent. Next. <laughs> because really, everyone's waiting for Jeff's question. Jeff, right, Absolutely. To close, and we close with our heavy hitter, Jeff, you have 10 seconds for your commercial. Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs, airing every Monday night at 8.30 p.m. on cable channel 21, CAN TV, throughout the city of Chicago, and on Comcast cable in many of your metro Chicago suburbs. I'm going to sit down if there's no questions. And sometimes on IllinoisChannel.org. WWW. All right, gotcha. Attorney no, General. Wait, I didn't give you all my website. Go on. Go ahead, go ahead. www.IllinoisAttorneyGeneral.gov. Everything I've talked about and so much more is on our website. Jeffrey, your question. There never is one. Here it is. <laughs> That's the fun of being the Attorney General. <laughs> Who's going to come after you? They can't. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Attorney General Madigan, uh, as you know, at the end of the last session, Governor Rod Blagojevich submitted some ethics legislation, or at least proposed it to the legislature near the end. I think Speaker Mike Madigan has some ideas and perhaps a package of his own. Uh, State Senator Steve Rauschenberger, who, as you know, is running for governor, has said, we've had all this ethics legislation, stacks on his desk, it really doesn't deter things. Look at what's been going on, he would say, in the last year in allegations about the governor. He says we need more ethical people and politicians, not more ethics legislation. So between the governor, the speaker, Senator Rauschenberger, where do you know, come? I know who's right. Yeah. I can tell you my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're fair and balanced, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Jeff, um, I think we need both. I think we could use better ethics legislation, and I think we could use more people uh, who look at government uh, as a way to help people. And so I am certainly right now actually looking at some of the proposals that are out there. Uh, they're, they're long and they keep on changing because, as you know, veto session is a pretty rapid and rapidly changing environment. And so I think I, a new iteration may have come out yesterday, and they're looking at some significant and I think important reforms in terms of, of pensions, 
uh, in, in particular, obviously, the pension boards, uh, some procurement reforms, uh, clarifying some of the things that were passed in the ethics legislation a number of years ago. So I, all of that is for the good. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, they'll actually be able to pass some meaningful legislation, and hopefully they can do it quickly. Will you weigh in specifically during the veto session as to your ideas on this specific legislation? We probably legislation? will be. I haven't actually read through the, the current draft of it because it literally just came out of LRB, I think, yesterday evening. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, a, bonus, a bonus round. Last question. Step right up. Thank you. Attorney General's on a roll. Lisa Ross Carlson, Associated Bank. I also serve on several boards as a volunteer. It's my understanding that the laws in Illinois do not protect uh, volunteer board members as strongly as they do in other states. Would you look into that and see what you can do to bring us up to par with the other states? Sure. If you would like to come in and, and meet with us, we'd be delighted to do that. Awesome. Thank you all. What? Yeah, where's, where's my...